uh, sleep and Asperger's syndrome. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't have any real disclosures other than to note that I do have a child who is on the autism spectrum. So, uh, so I have at least a, an interest, an obvious interest in this topic uh, in relation to that. So, uh, so moving forward, uh, let me see if I can move this slide forward. Shoot. Uh, hmm. There we go. I guess I'll have to use it this way. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, I'm going to run through uh, this outline that's, that's here on this page, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sleep disorders with autism, uh, spectrum disorders, including Asperger's syndrome. Uh, and then we'll go into, you know, what are the causes of some of these sleep issues, uh, and then, you know, how we might consider evaluating uh, for some of these sleep disorders, and then, you know, what are some of the treatments that we then might consider. So I'm going to start here with sleep disorders uh, with autism, spectrum disorders, including Asperger's syndrome. Uh, so autism itself, and, you know, I know that this is for Asperger's syndrome, I, there's going to be some interchangeability with what I discuss here in relation to autism and Asperger's syndrome. Uh, just knowing that a lot of the sleep issues are very similar. Uh, so when thinking about autism, I mean, there's, there's obviously, as, as you guys are well aware, a number of comorbidities that aren't necessarily all sleep related. Uh, there is a higher incidence of epilepsy or having seizure concerns in autism. Uh, there is uh, a higher incidence of GI-based disturbances. Uh, there's a very high incidence of certain psychiatric concerns, including anxiety, depression, uh, OCD, ADHD uh, as well, and then sleep disturbances are very common as, you, as you'll see here shortly uh, in this diagnosis as well. Uh, one of the things that I think, you know, it's always worth questioning, you know, is the sleep disturbance intrinsic to autism uh, or Asperger's syndrome or secondary to some of these comorbidities? Which you know isn't always an easy uh, isn't always an easy thing to figure out, but you know we certainly try hard to sometimes work and tease out those particular those particular associations. So, when thinking about sleep concerns in in autism, this is a list of some of the different things that that I often think about if I have a child and family that come to see me in the office. So I, I put insomnia here at the at the top of the list, just because insomnia tends to be the uh, uh, the more common thing that we think of uh, in terms of an association with uh, with autism and even an Asperger's syndrome as well. Uh, sleep onset and maintenance, so meaning difficulties falling asleep, as well as then difficulties maintaining sleep, are the typical things we think about when it comes to insomnia. Uh, then moving down, you have restless leg syndrome. Uh, and periodic leg movement syndrome, they're, they're very similar, not necessarily the same. And, you know, in a little bit, we're going to come to these, and I'm going to speak more about what these are. And they are things that I also, and we should think about in any particular person who has a sleep problem. Uh, circadian rhythm disorders, uh, a common one that we think about in adolescence is something called delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is where the circadian rhythm is delayed. So rather than having an, a, a typical bedtime or falling asleep around 10 p.m. for uh, the person or the child or adolescent, uh, they might be falling asleep at midnight or 1 in the morning or sometimes even later. So there's this delay in the onset of sleep. They still sleep well, but they just have this delay in the onset of sleep. Uh, which can really impact how sleepy they are the next day. Sleep apnea is something that I do see uh, as well in individuals, uh, children, adolescents who have uh, a diagnosis of autism or Asperger's syndrome. So it's definitely something that it crosses everybody's uh, potential health health risks. Uh, parasomnias are uh, things such as sleepwalking, night terrors. Uh, things of that sort that we uh, can see for any particular child or adolescent uh, with a sleep disorder. So when considering uh, you know, sleep disorders or sleep in Asperger's syndrome, uh, 
this was a survey that was done a number of years ago looking at sleep problems in children who have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. So you can see how there's a number of different things that are noted. So for example, 50% in this survey uh, noted they were disinclined to go to bed, or so difficulties going to bed and falling asleep. 75% uh, preferred having a light or TV a light on or a TV in their bedroom. 87% uh, uh, difficulty getting to sleep. 75% uh, of the survey answered uh, falling asleep while sweating, uh, which may indicate certain things, including like things such as anxiety. 50% uh, uh, were unrefreshed upon awakening the next morning, uh, and then 87% difficulty waking up the next morning, uh, and then 87% sleepy during the day. Uh, so you can see there's a, there's a high incidence of certain types of sleep symptoms that, and findings that may be present in uh, individuals who have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. So looking at insomnia and autism, uh, or insomnia with, with autism, uh, you can see that there is a very high incidence of insomnia when when you have a diagnosis of autism. So this was uh, looking at parental reports, actigraphy, uh, which is a watch that, that you can wear to tell if you are, hopefully it can tell you if you're sleeping or awake, as well as potentially some studies looking at polysomnography or sleep studies, uh, and, and getting a sense of you know, one's risk for insomnia. And through looking at a number of different studies, there's about, there, there was a fairly wide range of children with autism who had insomnia. So 44 to 83% looking at a number of studies that are uh, looking for that diagnosis of insomnia. Typical developing kids, you can still see, though, have a fairly high incidence of insomnia as well. So, so yes, it's higher when you are thinking of a child who may have autism. But you can still see it in children who are who are typical developing as well and don't have that such a diagnosis. Uh, so insomnia, basically, thinking of like you know what are the findings? So prolonged time to fall asleep, uh, later bedtime, decreased sleep duration. So not only do they have a hard time falling asleep, but they often the person with insomnia often wakes up early, or they're even having prolonged nighttime awakenings. So increased arousals and awakenings through the night. Uh, and then this early morning wake time that's mentioned here. Uh, this is what I just mentioned a, a minute ago. Insomnia, it does occur uh, pretty commonly up to about 50% of typical develop, developing children as well. So it's a pretty common diagnosis. Uh, parent report, uh, so when thinking about parent report versus these other objective measures, this, this actigraphy type of watch as well as sleep studies, the parent reports in general are fairly consistent with some of the objective studies. And, and so I think, you know, parents often can provide, I mean, can, can usually provide very good detail as to this diagnosis. And you don't necessarily have to have, you don't, you for sure don't need to have a sleep study to diagnose insomnia. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to have other types of uh, uh, kind of objective uh, things such as these actigraphy watches to make this type of a diagnosis. But they, they can be helpful as well. Uh, so, you know, amount of sleep and behavior in autism spectrum disorders, and this is, I think, worth considering. Uh, you know, fewer hours of sleep per night. Uh, this, this was a study back in 2004, so there, there's not a lot of earlier recent studies, but at least looking back at some of the studies that have been done, uh, you can see that fewer hours of sleep per night is associated with more severe symptoms of autism. Uh, such as stereotypic stereotype behaviors and social communication. So, so there does at least appear to be uh, an association of less sleep leading to more severe symptoms of autism. Uh, also in this study in 2009, uh, there was looking at poor sleepers versus good sleepers by using combinations of this actigraphy watch as well as, as, well as sleep studies. You can see how inattention, hyperactivity, uh, which are symptoms that are very typical for ADHD, uh, and even restricted uh, behavioral, or restricted repetitive behaviors are much more commonly found 
when you have someone uh, with, the, with an autism diagnosis who is a poor sleeper versus a good sleeper. Uh, so, I mean, these are, these are uh, at least really kind of point out that if you're not getting good sleep or not getting enough sleep, it, it certainly may correlate with the autism diagnosis and severity of the symptoms uh, associated with autism. The challenge, though, is, you know, is it truly uh, just, is it an association? Is it causing some of the daytime impairments and symptoms or not? And, and, and you know, that's always the big question, the chicken or the egg. Which one is it? I mean, is it the poor sleep? Is it having autism or Asperger's syndrome? And some of the associated challenges with that diagnosis that might then uh, be kind of causing not only the daytime concerns, but even the difficulties with falling asleep. So I'm going to read this here. Is poor sleep the cause or the result of more problematic daytime functioning in autism spectrum disorders? And then is the severity of autism spectrum disorders contributing to both poor sleep and more impaired daytime functioning? So it's, it's a challenge to work these things out, but no matter how we look at it, I think we all recognize if you're not getting enough sleep, or you're having poor quality sleep, you know, it makes us feel bad. We don't feel as good the next day. And so it's, and if this is happening night after night after night, it's probably fair to say that the sleep issues, they're not helping. They're making whatever is going on with that child likely worse. Uh, and so uh, it, it is an important piece of information and something for us to always keep in mind. Uh, so, so moving forward. So, so I'm going to go on to the next uh, part of the outline, which is uh, what are the causes in terms of some of these sleep issues in children who have Asperger's syndrome or autism. Uh, so sleep problems are a result of, so thinking about uh, you know, intrinsic biological or genetic abnormalities. So, so is there something, you know, that this child genetically is predisposed to in terms of their sleep issues. I mean, is there something, an alteration within the brain or the biochemistry within the brain, the, the different types of neurotransmitters, the anatomy? So is there some type of biological or genetic cause for some of the sleep problems that are going on? Uh, psychological or behavioral characteristics, I think, are definitely worth considering. I mean, we know that anxiety, depression, and, and things of that sort are are very commonly associated with sleep concerns. And then, you know, it's always worth coming back to the, the family home, the environment that, that we each live in and that, that each of our children lives in, uh, knowing that, you know, that environment very likely does play a role with how one might sleep. And, and the less uh, conducive the environment is for sleeping, the more likely they're going to have a hard time with falling asleep and staying asleep. So considering causes of insomnia in autism, spectrum disorders, Asperger's syndrome, and the like, uh, you know, it's, it's potentially multifactorial and not just one particular thing. So for example, biological, and we talked, I mentioned the neurotransmitter abnormalities, but maybe there's something different about that child's brain that may make them more at risk for difficulties with sleep. Are there GI intestinal problems? Uh, could there be issues with constipation or diarrhea that may be occurring over the nighttime hours as well and causing some of these symptoms in poor quality sleep with nighttime awakenings? And, and it definitely is reported as a potential cause. Uh, neurological, I mean, are there seizures? Are there seizures that are just happening at night and not necessarily during the day? Uh, because that is a potential that you can have a nocturnal seizure disorder that really isn't as recognized during the daytime. Uh, I mentioned anxiety, depression, uh, OCD, ADHD, uh, all these things. We know that there can be an association of these with insomnia in particular. Uh, medications, so uh, certain types of depression medications, the SSRIs, stimulants for sure when it comes to ADHD. If, there's, if they're timed poorly and you're getting a medication that still is in the system at nighttime when going to bed, uh, that may very well impact the ability to fall asleep. So it's always worth considering how the medications might be playing a role with, uh, with 
with sleep. And, and AEDs is anti-epileptic drugs, so some of the seizure medications. Um, sleep disorders, so sleep apnea, the parasomnias, the restless leg syndrome, periodic leg movement disorder. I'm going to talk in brief about those as well. Uh, these are definitely some of the causes for sleep problems. Uh, behavioral, so going back to the lack of routines, the sleep habits. We refer to this typically as sleep hygiene. I mean, do they have, does the child have a good routine that carries over from weekdays to weekends? Uh, are there differences from weekdays to weekends that actually make it more difficult for the sleep habits on the weeknights? I mean, the more the, the child is allowed to stay up late on the weekends, the more likely it will impact the ability to fall asleep on the weeknights. Uh, and, and so simple things as dimming lights and things of that sort, which we will come to here shortly as well, can be very important with uh, the child who has a sleep issue. Uh, I, I will say it's also worth considering if your child doesn't have a sleep issue, uh, I mean, yes, routines are still important. Uh, they might be a little bit less kind of, we may not have to be quite as strict with some of the sleep habits, but I think even for the average child who doesn't have sleep issues, routines and good sleep habits and hygiene are really probably a good thing to still consider with even your, just, just your, your average child, even your child with autism and Asperger's syndrome who doesn't have a sleep problem. So keeping that in mind is always a good thing. Uh, and this is just a nice picture of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice when the sleepovers occur, having a uh, having a bed that, that they can all share and sleep in. Uh, probably not the best thing on a nightly basis at home. Uh, but, you know, every home is a little bit different on what's allowed. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, so just something that I at least just wanted to point out. So melatonin in autism, this is a, a good topic in the sense that, you know, so melatonin, our bodies create melatonin. And this is, so I'm not going to talk about melatonin as a medication yet. I'm going to talk more about you know, our own natural melatonin in our bodies. So melatonin in general, it helps to organize our circadian rhythm. And, and our circadian rhythm basically refers to you know, when we sleep and when we are awake. Uh, and we have a natural tendency to become sleepy in the evening hours you know, after the sun has set and then, and then to sleep through the night and then you know when the sun rises to have uh, an alter or have a reduction in our own natural melatonin uh, in the early morning hours so that we're then more likely to wake up in the morning as the sun's coming up uh, and then throughout the day you might you actually have a little bit of an increase in melatonin in the afternoon and, but the biggest increase really occurs you know as it's becoming evening again as the sun is setting um, and through this, we have a, a kind of a change in our core body temperature as well. So over the nighttime hours while we're sleeping, our core body temperature drops. And in the more early morning hours, it starts to rise again and rises some throughout the day. And then eventually begins to drop again at nighttime as our melatonin output goes up uh, during the, uh, the, the nighttime hours. Zika bars refer to... Uh, a uh, kind of a, a natural kind of cue or some cues that actually play into timing of natural melatonin release and the sleep cycle. So, so for example, the sun, the sun coming up in the morning and then the sun setting in the evening is a cue to our body's natural melatonin production uh, and, uh, and cycling that helps us sleep. Meals, so timing of dinner, timing of breakfast, timing, timing, timing of our meals can definitely play a role in uh, kind of the natural rhythm of melatonin. Uh, social cues in general, you know, uh, wind down time in the evening, reading a book, uh, dimming lights, these are all different social cues uh, that may uh, help to kind of impact our own natural melatonin output that goes on. Uh, so this is kind of pointing out the importance of routines as well and trying to get into good, healthy routines that are more likely to create uh, better sleep habits and better sleeping in general. So this is, this is a, a circadian rhythm looking at, so from 8 p.m. 
this is these are the nighttime hours from 8 p.m. until coming across and then back over here to 6 in the morning uh, and then our daytime hours here uh, this red line really kind of is to simulate what happens with our melatonin uh, and our sleep urge. So you can see in the early afternoon we get a little bump in our sleep urge and melatonin and then it comes back down and then as the sun sets we get another large spike in melatonin production in our sleep urge and then you know throughout the night melatonin goes down, our sleep urge goes down and you're back to being more awake and alert. This the other line here is in reference to our natural homeostatic drive to sleep. So this is, it is circadian rhythm based to some degree, but it's something that you can overcome. But you know, throughout the day, other things are likely building up in our body that are making us sleepy. Uh, and throughout the day, as these natural kind of breakdown products of our body are building up, you are becoming more sleepy and there's an urge to sleep as well because of this natural homeostatic drive to sleep. You can actually, you can overcome your circadian rhythm drive and stay up later and potentially even pull off an all-nighter. Uh, the sleep need here, the homeostatic drive will continue to build and build and eventually, I'm going off the chart here, eventually it builds to a point where you really can't overcome it any longer. And, and this is when it kind of it eventually takes over, and you are going to eventually fall asleep. I mean, if you think about having pulled an all all nighter, there is eventually a point where you can't stay awake, and that's not driven by your by your circadian rhythm. That's driven by this homeostatic drive to sleep and the body's need. So, so moving forward, so circadian circadian rhythmicity and autism spectrum disorders. Uh, so. There actually is, and this is based on some studies that are out there, uh, there actually is a little bit of a phase delay in, in, in many individuals who are on the autism spectrum disorder, this phase delay in the melatonin. So that spike in melatonin, instead of occurring here, maybe starting to come up around 8 o'clock, it may not, this may be pushed over here and starting to rise at 10 o'clock. Uh, and so that's a delay in the uh, circadian rhythm uh, that can lead to difficulties in falling asleep. So we can actually, it's a pretty common thing in adolescence. We actually see this in about 5% of the average adolescent population where they have what's called delayed sleep phase syndrome, where they have a very difficult time falling, falling asleep because of this natural kind of delay in the timing of the melatonin release uh, that then makes it harder to fall asleep, but they still will sleep through the night uh, and just wake up later if they're allowed. Uh, so, but now thinking about autism and the circadian, circadian rhythm, there's also a reduced amplitude uh, in, in a number of individuals with autism so that the amount of melatonin that our brain releases may not be as high in someone who has autism. Uh, or even Asperger's syndrome, which then may lead to difficulties in maintaining sleep through the night. So there may be a greater risk of awakenings during the night because of just the natural melatonin output that the brain has. Uh, so it's definitely important, I guess, for us to keep this in mind and to consider, is this part of what might be causing uh, some of the sleep problems? Uh, so then anxiety and depression uh, in relation to sleep. So insomnia, it's very commonly associated with anxiety and depression, and really in all people. Uh, this is true in children and adolescents who are on the autism spectrum. It's true for anyone, uh, whether they have that diagnosis or not. Uh, so, so definitely if there is a diagnosis of anxiety or depression or the combination, insomnia is a fairly common finding. Uh, young adults with Asperger's syndrome, uh, insomnia a result can be definitely a result of high levels of anxiety based on some uh, data that is out there. Uh, children with Asperger's syndrome often self-report fears that they may have associated with sleeping. Uh, so you know it's you can see how nighttime fears uh, leading to anxiety. 
which then may lead to insomnia, difficulty falling asleep. So uh, it definitely can be a challenge. Uh, so depression in general can have uh, an association with difficulty settling at night, uh, which then uh, makes it hard to fall asleep. Uh, it can be associated with nighttime awakenings during the middle of the night, uh, and then not getting enough sleep because of those awakenings. Uh, it can be associated with early morning awakenings, so waking up earlier than one typically would. Uh, so that's certainly a challenge if you uh, aren't getting sleep because you're waking up early. Uh, and then just decreased sleep efficiency, just meaning increased arousals uh, and more time awake than asleep through the night. So this points out here, young adults with Asperger's syndrome and insomnia, they, they may have a comorbid mood disorder, uh, anxiety, depression, and just keeping that in mind, I mean, if, if, if your child who is diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome happens to have insomnia, uh, but has never been diagnosed with anxiety or depression, it is worth considering that that still may actually be uh, present and may just be undiagnosed at that point in time. Uh, and then to consider that possibility uh, with your child and bringing it up to your physician uh, as something to, to think about. Okay, so, so ADHD, uh, children with ADHD in general uh, have more settling difficulties, more difficulties falling asleep. Uh, children with ADHD often have a restless sleep pattern. Uh, Children with ADHD, they, they also have an increased risk for something with this, this diagnosis of, of restless leg syndrome and periodic leg movement disorder. Uh, and there is actually an association of sleep apnea uh, in children who have ADHD. Uh, this last thing, daytime sleepiness. So kids with ADHD, I think, you know, one of the things that we always should consider is that uh, Children don't always display the typical symptoms of sleepiness that an adult might display, such as falling asleep uh, at different times during the day, uh, but they actually may have symptoms such as poor attention, poor focus, hyperactivity, which can be signs of sleepiness, and as you can see, they are also potential symptoms that might be giving them that diagnosis of ADHD. So. Uh, it's worth considering, is it truly ADHD or is it a sleep disorder that's leading to some of those symptoms of ADHD? So, so you know, I'm talking about ADHD in part because up to half the children with autism spectrum disorders meet criteria for ADHD. Uh, you know, there's a high percentage of ADHD that may also be seen in, in individuals who have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. So ADHD is just, a, it's a common, uh, finding in this population of individuals. Uh, and then always considering that if they're on medications for the ADHD, stimulants in particular, that the stimulants may impact their ability to uh, fall asleep, especially if they're taking an afternoon dose of that medication. Uh, many kids are taking a short-acting uh, stimulant after lunch or around lunchtime. Uh, if it's short acting, there's probably a strong likelihood it will be out of the system by dinner time. Uh, there is some potential, especially the later that medication is given, the more potential it will then lead to uh, uh, difficulties with falling asleep because there's still some of that medication in their body uh, when it's bedtime. So that's a really important thing to think about in, in, in kids who are on stimulant medications. So, so this, these diagnoses of restless leg syndrome and periodic leg movement disorder are very interesting and unique uh, things to consider. And it's not that there's a greater uh, potential for these diagnoses in someone who has Asperger's syndrome or an autism diagnosis, but it's still that they can have them. Uh, so restless leg syndrome is a, uh, it's, it's a syndrome where the person, in, usually in the evening hours when they're starting to wind down and get ready for bed, they start to notice an uncomfortable sensation in their legs. It might feel like there's electricity in their legs. It might feel like there's just discomfort or pain. 
They might experience uh, temperature kind of changes where they feel hot. Uh, and children, younger children in particular, this is hard to get this information out of them. Uh, but one of the things that, that, that I'll ask is, do they feel like, do they ever have this sensation of electricity or even something like what's called creepy crawlies in their legs? It is a funny term that sometimes kids have used when describing how their legs feel at night if they happen to have this diagnosis. And with this, it can, uh, it can definitely make it hard to fall asleep. Uh, it also tends to be that these symptoms improve when moving their legs. So you'll find that they have an urge to move their legs because movement makes their symptoms better. Uh, with periodic leg movement disorder, which is commonly associated with RLS, uh, Periodic leg movement disorder is a condition where you may not actually even know what's going on, uh, and the child may not know it either. Uh, usually with this, it is a periodic twitching or movement of the lower of the legs that occurs during sleep throughout the night. Specifically, it occurs during what's called non-REM or non-rapid eye movement sleep. Not that that's necessarily as important, but, but they have these periodic movements throughout the night. That, uh, that can lead to increased arousability and potentially awakenings. And so uh, that is typically, you know, so if someone notes that their child's kicking their legs a lot at night and, and having poor sleep quality, that could be a symptom or a sign. Uh, you know, if we're having things that make us suspicious for this, this is where a sleep study may actually help to make this type of a diagnosis. Because part of the sleep study involves uh, these leg leads that tell us about leg movements during the night. Uh, restless leg syndrome, a sleep study won't necessarily give us an answer for that, but definitely for periodic leg movement disorder, that is the gold standard way to diagnose uh, periodic leg movements during sleep. So uh, one thing that can be associated with restless legs as well as periodic leg movements is iron deficiency or low iron stores. Uh, and so if, if you have low iron levels uh, in your body, it is more likely that if, if you are going to be predisposed or have a genetic predisposition to these leg movement problems, you will potentially be more likely to have the symptoms if you have iron deficiency. And you know, because of the restricted diets and even some of the GI symptoms or problems with, with poor absorption. Uh, you may have issues with the amount of iron that that child or adolescent is, uh, is getting into their body. So uh, it's really worth considering this as another reason for leg movement issues that might contribute to poor sleep as well. So just another, yeah, one thing to consider. Uh, but yeah, our restless legs and periodic leg movements, there's not a higher incidence that I'm aware of in, in autism or Asperger's syndrome, but it's definitely something that can be there. So moving on, so, so, so how do we evaluate for, uh, actually before we do the evaluation, I'm gonna take a quick moment and say, you know, another thing that I, I didn't put on here, sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is definitely something that I still do consider in, uh, in any patient, whether they have autism, Asperger's syndrome, or not, if there's a history of snoring, if there's a history of snoring with sleep disruption, or snoring with pauses in their breathing, snoring with gasping noises and, and the like, uh, that's something that should be a little bit kind of alarming and make you more suspicious that there could be a syndrome or diagnosis such as sleep apnea. Uh, it, is, it is definitely the case that you know sleep apnea uh, can be present in any child or adolescent. Uh, in particular, if your child has big tonsils and adenoids, it is more likely to put them at risk for sleep apnea. Uh, if your adolescent is having concerns with being overweight and, and possibly obesity, that is another uh, association with sleep apnea. So, so do keep that in mind. I do have a few kids uh, who are on the autism spectrum or have Asperger's syndrome who have sleep apnea, and we can address that in terms of treatment. So, 
Uh, so, so moving on, how do we evaluate for sleep disorders? Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that can be used is a, just, just a questionnaire that looks at uh, sleep habits and the like. So there is this questionnaire called the Family Inventory of Sleep Habits. Uh, Beth Malo uh, has uh, helped to put this together. She is a neurology and sleep physician uh, down at Vanderbilt in Tennessee uh, who has a very large interest in sleep disorders in children who are on the autism spectrum. Uh, and so there is this questionnaire, and here is that questionnaire that looks at sleep habits and the like. Uh, I'm not going to run through all of these, but uh, this particular questionnaire can give you a sense of, you know, what kind of how, how likely it is that there's a sleep issue. Uh, so yeah, so uh, you know, after this is done, I'm not sure if these slides are to become available or not for, for anyone who has an interest. I have no problem if that's an interest of people uh, to have this, to be able to kind of look at things like this. So just to keep that in mind as well. So other things that we, we use to, uh, to help give us a sense, it's a little bit blurry, uh, but a sleep log or diary can be a very helpful uh, way to assess the possibility for uh, sleep concerns. Uh, and, and, you know, this requires a parent or possibly I mean, an adolescent to, to fill out as well. They can help in filling this out. So you can see how, I mean, you can run through the days of the week. So this is a two-week example where you have, what time did you actually uh, go to bed? Uh, not only time did you, what time did you go to bed, but what time, how, time did you fall asleep, or roughly uh, time out of bed the next morning? Uh, what time did you wake up, which might be different than when you actually got out of bed. Uh, and then uh, time of your last meal, uh, caffeinated beverages, you know, even like the timing of the caffeinated beverages can be helpful. Uh, anything uh, arousing me during the night that might have been, uh, and I can't, uh, leg cramps that says, I thought that was saying something about dog. Uh, something, but no, I guess if you have a dog in your bed, that could be an issue with your sleep as well. So uh, if the dog's rolling over and uh, causing you to arouse, that's probably a time to consider that maybe the dog shouldn't be there. But uh, actually, animals can be a good thing for some children on the spe autism spectrum as well. So we'll come to that in a little bit too. That's actually in here. So uh, moving on. So sleep studies. Uh, Polysomnograms refers to a sleep study. Uh, what, so this is a test that is considered the gold standard for detecting sleep apnea, uh, periodic leg movement disorders, so the leg movements during sleep, uh, for detecting uh, seizures during the night, uh, and you can, you can find parasomnias, so sleepwalking and things of that sort. Uh, it's not the test for insomnia. Uh, the sleep lab environment itself may actually cause insomnia. So, so really, you know, having a, uh, a person go to the sleep lab to assess for insomnia probably is going to create more symptoms of insomnia and really isn't going to give us an answer. Uh, so this is a child who uh, is set up for a sleep test. You can see there's a lot of different wires, and, and this can be a challenge, especially for younger ch children. I mean, whether they have autism, Asperger's syndrome, or not, uh, this is not easy for a two-year-old to have on their body. Uh, so uh, it, it's it, it definitely, uh, you know, some children who are on the autism spectrum or have Asperger's syndrome, uh, if there's anxiety and the like, this can be a problem at any particular age uh, for some of these kids. But I will say that, you know, with the right technologist, with the presence of the parent who's there the whole night, uh, and with patience uh, on the part of everybody who's there, most kids can have these done reasonably well. Uh, and so uh, it, it may cause some challenges falling asleep for some kids. Uh, most kids will fall asleep, though, with all of this on. Uh, so although it can be challenging, it can be a very helpful test uh, when looking for things such as sleep apnea. I think that's worth, it's worth pointing out. You know, this is why it's important to perform these tests when it's indicated and not just perform it because, 
because the child's having sleeping difficulties. You know, if we're thinking the child might have sleep apnea, or we think the child might have periodic light movements during sleep, you know, then this type of a sleep study may be useful. Uh, we shouldn't just perform it for any old reason. Uh, because, you know, a sleep test isn't necessarily an easy thing for everybody to have done. So, uh, so actigraphy. This is a picture of some of the different watches that exist uh, as, as kind of ways to monitor sleep. Uh, so there are tools for measuring sleep patterns and response to treatment in individuals that can be used for those with neurodevelopmental disorders as well. But they can be used for anybody. Uh, and what they do is they, they detect movement or motion. Uh, and, you know, when we're sleeping, we're not moving as much. And the watch will, uh, will make a assessment that you are likely sleeping when the movement has gone down to a certain level. And then when you're awake, when you have more movement, whether that's awakening at night and you're moving or awakening in the morning normally, uh, it then makes the assumption that the person is then awake. You can see how it can be helpful in, in understanding when one is sleeping as, as well as when one's awake. But you can also see how it may not be perfect. Uh, you can potentially trick, uh, you, can, you can trick the watch that you might think they're sleeping when maybe they're awake. I mean, if you can lie still enough or motionless enough in bed, you can make it so the watch thinks that you are sleeping. Usually that's hard to do, though, uh, in that uh, we still often have some movement that the watch detects and can usually tell if you're, if you're moving enough to consider it awake. So but there is some potential for it to be tricked. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a printout of what this looks like when you've had an actigraphy study done. Uh, you can see where the blue is. This is where the watch is uh, noting that you are likely sleeping. There's still this, so the black bars here refer to movement. And you can see there's lots of movement through the daytime hours, and at night there's a little movement that occurs at points, but much less than what you see once you wake up and you get much heavier black bars throughout the daytime hours. And so this gives you a sense of, you know, when the person is sleeping and when they're awake and, you know, how much even arousability is happening during that. Because all these little black bars in the blue part referred to points where there was movement. And so there's some arousability that's happening at those points during the night. So, uh, so that gives you a sense of what the actigraphy study tells us. Uh, this is a, a, another way that one can look at sleep. Now, it's definitely not a medical used device to measure sleep, but you know, Fitbit, whether it's Fitbit, whether it's Garmin, whether it is some other uh, one of these, these newer watches that one can wear uh, or have attached to, their, to, their, to themselves. Uh, these things are relatively good at detecting movement. I don't you really use these in the clinic setting as a way to, to, to look at sleep in, in my patients. But I will say once in a while, a parent brings in or happen to have it on their phone and they will uh, show me the printout that, that they have seen uh, and, and give you a sense of what might be going on. There, there, definitely, there, there is some research that has compared things such as the Fitbit watch to a typical actigraphy watch, and, and the Fitbit watches are not quite as good, but I think they are still uh, potentially useful. And, and this is a, uh, a little printout uh, of what one might look like from a Fitbit. So you can see how, uh, so this is the nighttime hours from about 10 p.m. until 7 or so in the morning. And you can see very little movement that the, fit, that the Fitbit watch is actually noting. Uh, some movement, and then you can see at this point there's a lot of movement at, at this particular schedule, and then he falls asleep, and there's less but still some movement. And this person, or this pattern, is a lot more movement and, and likely awake time. Uh, it's far from perfect, but I think it can give you at least a little sense of what might be going on. So, so not that I would consider this to be a perfect way to judge sleep, uh, but I do think you know it can be something that 
one might consider trying and putting on their child if they're wondering or worried about the sleep and wanting to get a little bit of a better sense of what might be going on. Uh, so moving forward. So what are the treatments and what are some treatments for, uh, for some of these sleep disorders that, that I've been talking about? So for insomnia, you know, so we have behavioral type therapy. So this includes good sleep habits and hygiene, something called cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and then there's also pharmacologic or medications. And I'm going to touch on this a little bit more. Uh, so this is just a quick little uh, vignette of, uh, you know, a typical or a potential child that might show up in clinic uh, with a sleep concern noted. So I'm going to read this. So John is a 10-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome and has concerns for insomnia. He enjoys Coke with dinner and recently got an Xbox for his birthday, which he plays after dinner. Bedtime is 8 p.m. He has difficulty initiating sleep and will often recite segments from his favorite video for one to two hours before falling asleep. He is overly active during the day. His parents are exhausted and his mother often sleeps with him so the family can sleep. So I mean, I don't know if this necessarily uh, fits into your home and what you guys see, but, uh, but it is something that, that, you know, there are families that have somewhat similar stories that I have seen in clinic. Uh, so components of successful sleep, considering, you know, sleep hygiene. So first thing, you know, daytime habits, this can play a role with good sleep. Does ex exercising can be good. Exercising at night, maybe not so much, but exercising during the morning or daytime hours may be perfectly help, good and helpful with falling asleep. Getting lots of light during the daytime hours, uh, not at night, so dimming the lights at night is not is probably ideal. Avoiding caffeine, especially, I tell families when there is a sleep issue that after lunch, there really probably shouldn't be any caffeinated beverages from that point forward. Um, limiting naps, especially late afternoon or longer naps, I think it's important for having, that's a good important step for sleep habits. Uh, selective bedroom use, uh, you know, really trying to kind of ensure that they're sleeping in their bedroom, they're not sleeping on the couch, they're not sleeping uh, in the parent's bed or someone else's bed, and trying to kind of just encourage that you know, they are in their bedroom. Uh, evening habits, calming activities in the evening, having the lights dimmed, uh, limiting their electronics uh, in, in terms of like their iPad time in the evening hours, or at the very least dimming the iPad uh, so that there's less, it's called blue light that comes off the screen. Uh, blue light tends, tends to be a stimulation type thing uh, and will stimulate the brain in a way that melatonin production will be reduced. Uh, and that's a problem for a lot of us. Uh, and, and you can see it in anyone uh, who is taking their iPhone, their iPad, their other electronic device to the bed with them. Uh, so, uh, so keep that in mind. Sleep environment. Everyone's a little bit different, but tends most people tend to prefer the environment a little bit a little bit cooler. Uh, some kids prefer certain textures or don't like certain textures with their sheets. Sounds is are there noises outside the room, outside the window? Uh, keeping the light to a minimum. Uh, you might want to consider uh, if, if the, the child is accepting or prefers it being really dark. You know, dark darkening shades. Uh, to help especially for the morning hours when that sun is coming up or during summertime when the sun is setting so late. Uh, that can be helpful. Uh, but also, uh, you know, considering you know, maybe there is a need for a night light, and I think that's okay, uh, or a closet light being on. Trying, though, to keep that to a minimum if you can uh, because light use tends to stimulate uh, the brain in a way that it reduces melatonin output. So, uh, so keeping that in mind. Uh, bedtime, you know, having that routine of brushing one's teeth at a certain time, possibly a shower, reading books, uh, having a regular bedtime and wake up time as well. And then you're trying to get the right amount of sleep uh, as best as possible. Uh, so timing of bed is important. There is something called the forbidden zone. Some people will find that their child has this point in the night, often it's about, let's just say they have a bedtime, they're usually falling asleep around 8, 8.30. Well, you might find that they have this time around 7 o'clock where all of a sudden there's this burst of energy. Uh, 
and and that's called the forbidden zone. And it's actually very it's fairly common, and you will likely have a very difficult time getting your child to fall asleep during that time. So you really don't want to be trying to put your child to bed during that forbidden zone uh, if you are recognizing that. But but you're still doing the calming activities during that time, the, the dimming of the lights, the movement towards bed that is to help them uh, uh, become more relaxed and able to fall asleep, trying to kind of reduce the electronics or keeping the lights more dim on the electronics at the very least. Uh, I tend to encourage, you know, the last hour before bed, not being on electronics if possible. Uh, we really try to keep little night-to-night -night variation uh, in general for this. Uh, you want to have weekdays and weekends be pretty similar. Uh, so here's some visual cues uh, or visual schedules that one might use. I mean, this can be very helpful for some kids, especially those who like their schedules. And I think we know that uh, these schedules uh, can, especially for children on the autism spectrum or Asperger's syndrome, it, it can be very helpful. And, and I mean, I've seen it in my own house where we use these types of schedules or have used these schedules to help. Uh, works well for our typical child as well. So it's been for, useful for both. Uh, so, for example, putting on the pajamas, using the bathroom, washing hands, brushing all these different things uh, can be good to kind of consider as a way, and then this being a nice visual for uh, what one might use. We actually created one where we took pictures uh, of our kids brushing teeth and all this uh, kind of things to help kind of prepare for bed. So you might even use just your own pictures that you take and then put on a kind of a, a, kind of a, a paper like this to kind of run through that schedule and check off. So just some, some thoughts. Uh, sleep tips. So for adolescents, I mean, the goal really should be to get about eight to nine hours of sleep a night. Uh, younger kids, nine to 11 hours is, is a goal that one should have. Realizing that not every child is going to get this, but it's uh, what one might shoot for. Avoiding caffeinated beverages, uh, especially after the lunch hours and, and into the evening hours, uh, for sure, uh, tobacco and alcohol uh, should be avoided. Uh, opening blinds or shades in the morning hours can be good at getting one's circadian rhythm and balance and helping to wake up in the morning if that's hard to get them up. Avoiding bright lights in the evening, dimming the lights as has been mentioned. Uh, that one hour or more of relaxation before bed, completing homework activities earlier in the evening or the afternoon if possible. Baths might be relaxing for some kids. Uh, you know, exercising in the afternoon, uh, but four hours or more before bed is good. So the closer it is to bedtime, the potential for it to make it harder to fall asleep uh, will go up. So keeping that in mind with exercise. Uh, bedroom, is it too hot, too cold? Is the room too bright? Is the room too noisy? Uh, are there distractions? I mean, the TV, you know, I have so many patients and, and, and parents as well who will say that their child needs the television to fall asleep. Uh, you know, there may be occasional cases where that might be true, but I think, you know, it's worth recognizing that TVs promote watching them, which means that if you're watching them, you're not sleeping. So, you know, TVs in a bedroom, I tend to discourage, but what I have come around to considering is TVs that are on the music channel or a music station that's just playing the music might be reasonable and, and a consideration and a little bit of light might be helpful for some of those children who like a little bit of a light that comes off the TV. But at least then it's not uh, something that's going to promote them watching it. Uh, computer time, bringing the cell phone, uh, the iPad, whatever, video games, all these things are definitely, uh, I would say, that last one to two hours before bed, are, it's good to have those uh, no longer in use. Uh, you know, even moving the alarm clock. I mean, you know, if, if you're having a hard time falling asleep and you're constantly looking at what time it is, that can be very distracting and make it hard to fall asleep. And it's probably better than to turn that alarm clock around so you can't see it. So that is something that's recognized and suggested by 
uh, sleep physicians and sleep psychologists as another tool. Uh, so this just gives you a sense of you know what our kids often are doing at night, and uh, you know sometimes we're not even aware that this is actually happening. Uh, so be aware they might be doing this. So beware of the weekends. You know it's it's if your child doesn't have a sleep issue, this may not be. You may not need to be quite as strict on this, but I'd still say it's worth considering. You know, avoiding bedtimes that are more than an hour from the weeknight bedtime. Uh, so recognizing the later they're going to bed on the weekends, the later they are waking up on the weekends, the more likely it will impact their circadian rhythm that then makes it hard to fall asleep on the weeknights and wake up on the weekday morning. So trying to keep not only their bedtime reasonably close on the weekends, but also waking up no more than two hours from their normal schedule. So if they're normally waking up at six, you know, maybe sleeping until eight would be okay. Uh, you know, if they're sleepy and they truly need a nap, trying to keep it to the early afternoon and keeping it short is probably reasonable. But the more you sleep during the day, especially the later in the day, the more likely it's going to make it hard to then fall asleep at night. So keep that in mind. Uh, Parental tips. So promote a safe, healthy environment for sleep. Uh, you know, age-appropriate schedules. You know, your 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 five-year-old shouldn't be going to bed at uh, ten o'clock or midnight. I mean, the, you know, and it's not uncommon that weekends come and those change those those times for bed will change quite a bit. Uh, even the weeknights, there are some younger kids who are staying up much later than one should be staying up. So, you know, trying to have age-appropriate schedules. You know, even us being a role model, uh, we should make sleep a high priority in our lives, too, because if our, I mean, one, we need our sleep uh, as much as our kids do, and two, uh, you know, it's uh, what our kids see us doing can impact, you know, how they might potentially uh, uh, approach this as well. Uh, you know, talk with your child about their sleep problems. Uh, get a sense of what they see as problems and challenges, and, and that may help you to kind of help them to resolve some of the challenges. Recognize signs of sleep deprivation. I mean, are they are they having issues with uh, falling asleep at school? Uh, those poor attention, poor focus, and hyperactivity concerns may be signs of inadequate sleep as well. Uh, so strategies for sleep resistance. Uh, these are some things that, that I have at least had discussions with, with a, a good number of families about. Uh, and, and, you know, these can be used in, in the average child. They can be used for children who have Asperger's syndrome as well as autism. But I will say that it becomes a little bit more challenging to use some of these strategies in children who do have neurodevelopmental problems. Uh, so, you know, the traditional extinction me method really just basically implies, you know, you put your child in their crib or their bed, and you leave the room, and uh, you might check on them every 15 minutes or so, but you allow them to potentially cry themselves to sleep. Uh, that doesn't always work. I mean, I, I think it works for a lot of kids if you show them a lot of love throughout the day and make them recognize this is not a punishment. Uh, but it, it's challenging for the average child, but it's definitely, I think, a much more challenging thing for a child who has uh, autism or Asperger's syndrome. So one of the things that I will often uh, go to is, uh, you know, there's, let me see if I, here we go. So kind of a modified approach to, uh, to, to helping them learn to fall asleep on their own. So you can put like a chair uh, it doesn't have to be a rocking chair. It can be just any old chair, uh, possibly a mattress, but, but you know, a chair that, that's in the doorway or in the room that you as a parent sit on, uh, and you might possibly need earplugs, uh, but at least you can see your child. You can choose to have the back of the chair to the child, or you can choose to just sit there facing the child but with a book that you're trying to read or something. And, I prefer it being in the doorway because then you can at least kind of prevent them from getting out of the room. Uh, the child may fall asleep on the floor because they're upset. Uh, that's okay. That's not the worst thing in the world. 
I mean, they can always be put back into bed once they have fallen asleep, or you can choose to put the blanket over top of them on the floor. And doing this multiple nights in a row may then lead to improvements in their sleep habits and ability to fall asleep. You know, with this, I think it's important that, you know, you keep reminding them this is at least not not during the moment when you're actually uh, in the room and, and sitting in the chair and trying hard to not have that interaction with your child. You don't remind them so much then. You really try to be quiet, but the next day reminding them, you know, this is not punishment. And then that you love them and you, you try to move forward without drawing too much attention to this. You might even consider rewards. Uh, morning stickers or a small reward of some sort, like a, something from the dollar store, for having a good night where they actually uh, were able to kind of fall asleep. Or they might even, even if they had a bad night, but they but they still fell asleep without you getting in bed with them, uh, that can be a fairly reasonable thing to say. They get a small reward the next day uh, to help them feel, or to, to gain you know, some appreciation for, for what they're doing and going through. And then, you know, doing that over some time often changes behaviors and habits. Uh, so something that one can consider. Um, the bedtime pass, this is a video that actually has, a, it's actually used, and, and this video actually talks about it in the setting of children on the autism spectrum and Asperger's syndrome. But it is as you create a pass and, uh, the child helps you create it, actually, and they may be the one who makes the pass. They can put their name on it here, uh, and they're allowed. You might, they might have one pass or two passes, and they're allowed one or two passes where they can come to you with the pass, and they need to get up and go to the bathroom or to get a drink, uh, but then they have to go back to bed. And sometimes just knowing that they have this pass reduces their anxiety some and might help them to actually fall asleep. Uh, more easily. So this is something that has been used and can, very, can be very helpful for some families. Uh, other sleep aids, uh, I'm sure many of you have like the weighted blanket. Some people like pressure uh, on them with the weighted blanket. I think some children like sleeping bags, a body pillow, uh, transition objects, uh, can be uh, stuffed animals or something of that sort. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned pets earlier. Pets can be disruptive, but some pets can actually, I think, be a bit helpful, I mean, in terms of making the child feel more comfortable and relaxed and less anxious by knowing that their, that their pet dog or cat might be in the room with them. Relaxing music or other white noise, such as the sound of the rain, sound of the ocean, uh, the sound of a fan, can be relaxing for some people. Uh, so here are some different things in terms of big teddy bear, uh, big body pillow, uh, you know, a stuffed animal, or not stuffed animal, a little, little doll, uh, and then uh, their dog in the bed with them too. So these are some different things that one might consider. Uh, so, uh, so relaxation techniques. Uh, so there's this thing called cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this is basically a uh, a way to uh, usually it's done by a sleep psychologist who works with. Uh, individuals with insomnia to help them learn how to relax and calm their mind when it's time for bed. Uh, and, and so it, it involves meeting usually a sleep psychologist to learn good techniques to help you fall asleep. Much better than medications in general. Uh, so, so I would definitely you know, think of this. Meditation, yoga, mindfulness type techniques can be relaxing progressive muscle relaxation, which is trying to talk your body through relaxation from head to toe when you're in bed trying to fall asleep, deep breathing exercises, a slow relaxing breathing, or imagery, thinking of, you know, the, the cow jumping over the moon or some other relaxing imagery that might help you to, uh, to kind of calm and relax and fall asleep. Uh, so this is just, you know, there are apps on one's phone that one can, can utilize to kind of help with uh, this thing called Meditation Oasis is one that, that I've actually uh, 
uh, attempted myself and have found myself falling asleep uh, uh, in the evening when I didn't want to fall asleep by listening to some of this, just trying to learn about different uh, apps. So this may provide some level of relaxation and ability to fall asleep if you have insomnia. Uh, so light box therapy, this can be very helpful for people who have circadian rhythm sleep disorders. Uh, it's, a, it's a very intense light. Uh, the intensity has, is, is what's at 10,000 lux, which is a very high intensity. And usually when people have a delayed sleep phase syndrome where they have a hard time falling asleep as well as a hard time waking up the next morning, using a light box first thing in the morning uh, for about 20 minutes can be helpful. You know, you can be putting on your makeup at this point in time. Uh, you can be eating your cereal with us at the kitchen table. So there's there's different ways to kind of make this part of the routine so you're not just kind of staring. I wouldn't be staring into the light. I think that's probably a little bit of an intense uh, thing to do. So, uh, But you can make it part of the routine. Uh, and that can help to organize or reset the circadian rhythm uh, for some people. Uh, pharmacological treatment. Uh, so usually when you think about medications, I think it's worth recognizing they're best used in addition to behavioral therapy, uh, uh, in addition or after you've had unsuccessful behavioral therapy attempts. But I really would say in addition, because you know it's hard, you know, I think we should always be trying to do the behavioral therapies first. Uh, but, uh, you know, in general, uh, you know, you might consider medications that may help with other things such as if they have a seizure disorder or anxiety or depression, you know, medicines that might be helpful for both. Uh, starting with a low dose, I think, is always important too. Children with developmental disorders, they're, they're at greater risk for the adverse effects and difficult, and really may have a difficult time letting you know that. Uh, so, so I think, you know, low dose is important with a starting, starting when starting a new medication. Um, melatonin is the one drug that's been really looked at in children with uh, autism and Asperger's, uh, and, and it really there, there's at least some benefit that has been seen. Uh, it, it's it can help in terms of the timing of falling asleep. Uh, you know, parents I think find it a nice one to consider because you know it's, it's often considered almost like a dietary supplement uh, with a few adverse effects. So I mean, it's a fairly well tolerated drug. Uh, you know, and there are some studies that have been looked at in melatonin use in autism spectrum that have shown some benefit. So for example here, uh, this is this very small study from 2003, 15 children treated with 3 milligrams of melatonin 30 minutes before bed uh, for two weeks. There was a 50% reduction in the time to fall asleep with the use of actigraphy to measure that. Uh, and, and they did see some improvements in behavioral scores and school performance by teacher reports. So there is at least some potential benefit. And, and you know, three milligrams is a, is a reasonable starting dose for melatonin. Uh, another study looking at melatonin in 25 children uh, back in 2006, uh, starting with three milligrams and titrating up to about four to six milligrams if needed. So looking at uh, children's sleep health questionnaire, uh, uh, and, and seeing improvement uh, overall in, in this uh, health questionnaire and sleep diaries uh, at one, three, and six months out from the start of the study. So I mean, there's at least some data. This is just a, a slide just showing you. There's a lot of different versions of melatonin on the market. And not that I know which one is best. Uh, you know, I, I just would encourage, you know, considering a brand name, uh, I mean, when I think of melatonin, and most often, and I have no stock in any company, uh, so don't at all consider this to be an endorsement for any of these. I mean, I will say though that that, that natrol uh, here is a common one that that I, I had at least kind of suggested. But you know, I think some of these other this Nature's Bounty here is one that that as well I think is is a well known one that. Uh, one may consider as well. So, so just some, some little thoughts. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't know for sure what you're getting in all of these products, uh, if they're really truly pure and is the dosing strength as accurate as you might hope and think. Uh, so, you know, family impact. Children's sleep problems that are associated with worse family functioning, including marital challenges, uh, maternal health has been noted, 
poor parenting can occur because of the impact on parents from the child sleep disorders. Uh, you know, there's few researchers who really considered the problem of sleep disorder and problems uh, and the impact it has on the family. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's always a very uh, important piece that often gets lost. You know, it's not just the child sleep problem. It really becomes the family's sleep problem. And, and keeping that in mind, I do think, is, is important and why we need to uh, really look at ways to try to help in these situations. So, so in summary, uh, you know, insomnia is the most common sleep disorder in Asperger's syndrome and autism disorders. Uh, look for comorbidities. Anxiety is very common. Address sleep environment and hygiene first. Consider relaxation techniques. You know, and, and melatonin may possibly be helpful in, in, in some of these kids as well. So, you know, in summary, sweet dreams, and uh, you know, I'm going to open it up for questions. Excellent. This was this was great, Ted. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have already come in via the chat, and. Um, if anyone else has some, feel free to type them in now. Do you want me? Do you, you see them? In? I don't see them because all I'm seeing is the last thing you entered, 121. Can you see this? Oh, okay. So why don't I read them to you? One is, uh, what is the casual relationship between poor sleep and more severe autism? So, you know, it, it kind of comes back to, uh, you know, is is one causing or impacting the other or not? Uh, I, I will say that you know when a child is on has an autism diagnosis, and and, and you know we all know that there are uh, uh, different levels of autism uh, as well as severity of the diagnosis, uh, and and there really does tend to be uh, you know, the more severe the autism. Uh, behaviors and difficulties may be. Uh, there really is an association. It seems to be more of a link with, you know, challenges with sleep. Uh, not all. I, so I, I don't want to definitely. I don't want to imply that 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 children on the more severe end of the autism spectrum tend to have more uh, sleep problems. It, it tends to though be the case. And you know, you know why that is. It's it's you know a little bit uncertain. But I think there's a lot of thought and belief that some of it is potentially related to anxiety surrounding uh, going to bed at night, whether that be the, the, the darkness, just whatever it is about, you know, being in bed at night and potential fears and anxieties that may come from it. Being alone, not having someone who's at their side. Uh, and I think we can all relate to that to some degree when thinking about any child uh, and, and being in, in bed at night. So uh, there's definitely that relationship. Now, no question, I, I really believe, you know, if you're not getting enough sleep because you're awake uh, and, and because for whatever reason, whether you're having nighttime fears or whatever, I mean, I truly believe that it's, I mean, we know how we feel when we don't get enough sleep. Uh, and, and there's no question that, you know, daytime behavioral concerns are going to be much worse if you're not getting enough sleep. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really a challenge. I mean, you know, there can be other things. I mean, I think it's always worth considering, is there something medical going on in that child? I mean, is there a constipation? Is there a GI problem? Uh, you know, are there other sleep issues, leg movement concerns or something that may be there? But, you know, in general, I, I would say probably the most common thing is going to be some anxiety uh, that likely factors into uh, you know why that child struggles and just having a greater risk of that with the more severe end of the autism diagnosis. I hope that I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. I hope it does. Okay, if you're um, if the audience is looking for more information, just type that in, and we can. We can go ahead and ask you. Um, our next question deals with melatonin. And the parent says that her 15-year-old daughter tried melatonin successfully for a while. And then um, ultimately it stopped working for her. And she wanted to find out if that was typical. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the one thing I will say about pretty much every sleep medication is that 
over time, they become less effective uh, with, with helping them fall asleep, whether it's melatonin, whether it is trazodone, whether it's clonidine. So trazodone and clonidine being prescription medications, uh, that, that is a problem. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I struggle when, when considering, you know, how aggressive do we want to be with, uh, with prescription medications. And it's partly why I feel a little bit more comfortable with melatonin. Uh, because, you know, you may increase dose, you find yourself increasing doses uh, as you have less of an impact from the dose that they're started on. Uh, and, you know, melatonin going up to 6 milligrams, and I you know there are people who will take it up to 9 milligrams or 10 milligrams. Uh, I don't like to go above, to be honest, I don't like to take melatonin above 6 milligrams. Uh, I worry a little less about increasing that dose than I do about increasing the dose of prescription medicines like trazodone or clonidine, and that does become a bit of a challenge. But, uh, you know, I, I often will, will suggest, you know, consider cycling of medications where you might use it for uh, five nights and then a couple nights off or four nights and a couple nights off, or you might even use it for two weeks on and then do a week or two off and then, you know, trying to kind of establish a pattern where you're not using it all the time. And cycling might give it more of a life uh, with, with continued use uh, over time. Always trying to stick with good sleep habits and hygiene and the behavioral parts of, you know, sleep that, uh, that, you know, no matter what medicine you're on, you still should always be working on those good sleep habits and hygiene as well. So... Okay. Another question deals with apnea and um, wondering if there's a relationship between high blood pressure and sleep apnea or even uh, seizures in sleep apnea. So in terms of high blood pressure and apnea, you know, there actually there, there is. Uh, there, there definitely, people with sleep apnea have a greater potential of having hypertension uh, as well. So, so there definitely can be an association. Uh, it, not necessarily but always the case. So people with high blood pressure don't always have sleep apnea. Uh, and people with sleep apnea don't always have hypertension. But I do think that if you have a patient who has more severe sleep apnea, high blood pressure is a greater, if there's a greater likelihood for it to occur. Uh, in regards to seizures and sleep apnea, it's not necessarily that seizures increase the risk of sleep apnea per se, uh, but I, I will say that if you have a seizure disorder and you happen to have sleep apnea as well, uh, it may be that poorly controlled sleep apnea might increase one's risk for nighttime seizures. Uh, so I think, you know, that's where it's worth considering, you know, you have that combination, treating the sleep apnea might help with some of the seizure control as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, everyone's a little bit different in terms of the reason for seizures. I mean, someone who has more, uh, more neurological problems, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean autism or Asperger's. I'm thinking more, you know, like, for example, cerebral palsy uh, or, or some other uh, kind of neurological disorder, there's a higher risk for both sleep apnea and seizures in those situations. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's not that one's causing the other, but you definitely can see that you know, poorly controlled uh, uh, sleep apnea may increase the risk for their seizures. So, okay. Okay. A couple more questions. Uh, the next one is regarding uh, st sleep strategies. And the question is, if unsuccessful with strategies, how does this transfer into adulthood and ongoing? Is there a worsening impact? So uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I'm going to have uh, <laughs> the, the best of answers for that. Uh, but, but I will say that, uh, you know, yes, if, if sleep strategies, that uh, are established early in life. I mean, not that there's great data on this, but one would suspect that if you uh, if you have better sleep habits and better sleep strategies 
earlier in life that it may improve one's sleep habits and ability uh, going into the adult years as well. Uh, it doesn't mean that things won't change though. I, mean, I think, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, as kids are getting older, uh, depending upon, you know, their ability to fully kind of recognize some of their sleep issues as well as become more in kind of in tune with anxiety or depression and some of the other comorbid things going on. Now, some of these individuals, I think, are able to uh, kind of work through some of their sleep issues a little bit more if they can, can kind of help address some of those other comorbid type conditions, the anxiety and the depression. So, you know, I wouldn't say give up uh, that, that you can't see improvement as you're getting older, but, but, you know, trying to get those sleep habits early on, I think, has the potential to improve uh, sleep in your adult years as well. But, but don't give up if you haven't gotten there uh, by the teenage years. I mean, I think you still try hard to work on that and encourage because we can still learn. Everyone can still learn, uh, you know, the, some of the right habits to help with sleep. Uh, I mean, getting that cell phone out of the room, uh, uh, turning off the TV or removing the TV and things of that sort. I mean, those are, I mean, probably things that this lady, this, this person is, uh, has already done. So I don't want to uh, imply that that's not happened in this case, but, you know, always looking, looking at the environment and truly seeing, you know, what might I be missing that I could potentially change. Darkening shades uh, to help keep that light out both, uh, uh, when it's time for bed as well as uh, in the morning when you're trying to get that last little bit of sleep. So, okay. All right, and our last question is, have you ever treated kids who have sleep problems related to autoimmune dysfunction? Uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm not sure if autoimmune dysfunction is referring to like an immunologic disorder or are we talking about things like uh, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm, I guess I'm assuming that's probably, I'm assuming that's what the question's related to. Uh, and uh, yes, you, you can see, uh, you can see that. And, and you know, a lot of times, you know, when, when you have other chronic illnesses, chronic medical, medical conditions, uh, there often is an element of, uh, of possibly anxiety and depression that's part of that other medical condition that, that can also then impair one's sleep as well. Uh, so any chronic medical condition has the potential to, to have an association with poor sleep, poor sleep uh, in terms of insomnia, uh, and you know, you know, I'm going to say even potentially uh, other things like sleep apnea. I mean, if you have an autoimmune or one of these rheumatologic type concerns or chronic medical condition that results in, you know, medications that impact weight gain, and you have concerns for increasing weight gain, you may have increased risk for sleep apnea. Uh, you actually find that certain chronic medical conditions, including things like kidney disorders, uh, and, and some of these potential rheumatologic autoimmune disorders can have kidney associations, have a greater risk for restless leg syndrome and periodic leg movement disorders. Uh, so, so you can see that as well. So. This is for autoimmune encephalitis. Autoimmune encephalitis. So uh, I can't say that I have seen that association of autoimmune encephalitis and a sleep disorder, but but I, I, I would I wouldn't be surprised or uh, I guess in some ways I, I would think that there definitely is some risk. I guess I'm not quite sure you know what the sleep concerns are if we're talking more difficulties with falling asleep, staying asleep, or uh, or something else in terms of uh, dysregulation of sleep. It's, I guess I would kind of guess that might be what it's referring to. Uh, and, and I would think that, you know, with any type of encephalitis picture, neurological disorder of that sort, that it has potential to lead to sleep dysregulation and uh, difficulties. But I have to admit, I haven't had any patients that I can recall coming to me with that particular uh, kind of uh, association or combination. Okay. All right. So we have, um, that was all the questions we have. Uh, oh, actually, there's one more, do, one last. Uh, my son had difficulty falling asleep due to OCD, 
but I didn't realize for years. Uh, how do you tell the difference between typical nighttime anxiety and clinical level OCD? You know, you, I'm not sure you're going to very easily be able to uh, kind of uh, differentiate those things. I mean, but I think it's, you know, part of it's questioning. You know, if, if, if your son can, can, let, can, can speak to that, in, in greater detail as to, you know, what are their, what are some of the things that might impact them at night? I mean, is this uh, uh, in relation to, you know, possibly some anxiety about the night? Do they have to uh, uh, kind of go through certain rituals and uh, uh, things to kind of help them to settle and get to sleep? You know, I, I do think, you know, it's, it's good to have that conversation and what are the particular things that are going on and, and then ultimately, I, I will say, I would probably want to address the OCD concerns first. But, and, and, you know, you can, but, you know, at the same time, I guess I'm going to say one can consider uh, the idea of meeting a sleep psychologist to talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and ways to calm the mind and relax the mind uh, and, and help, the, the, help the body and brain get ready for sleep. So, you know, you can consider both approaching the, the therapists and potential psychiatrists who might be helping with the OCD, but at the same time considering it, is it worth meeting a sleep psychologist who can help, you know, with possible cognitive behavioral therapy? Okay. Well, that is all the time we have and all the questions. Um, thank you very much, Ted, for this presentation. I did want to let the audience know that you'll be receiving um, a link to the video along with the presentation on Monday. And uh, if you have any other questions that we didn't get to today or you have any that come up after the fact, feel free to contact us at AANE uh, or check out our website at aane.org. And um, again, thank you very much for presenting and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. All right, thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.